about to start the next session. And uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing from Nir in this session. Uh, but, you, but you can take a seat, you're not the first. And our ne next speaker is, uh, is uh, Cole Christensen from University of Southern Denmark. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, to his talk. We've actually invited him many times to this meeting. Uh, so I'm glad that he is, uh, he's, uh, he's finally here. Thank you very much, uh, Morten, and thank you for the invitation, despite a few times I was not able to, to come. And what I want to talk about are families like this one. Uh, six sisters in 2004 on one of the sisters' 100th birthday. Eventually, these uh, sisters became close to 600 years. And as uh, Joris uh, mentioned previously today, there's a number of advantages of uh, studying this in longevity research. First of all, it was, it's more uh, stringent, I think you call it, Joris, phenotype than what you could call sporadic long livers. Because what is it about these six sisters? How did they manage? How did they succeed? We have had an interest in this for a very long time. And over the last 17 years, we have the privilege of being in the Long Life Family Study, which is a NIH-funded study, initially a U01, then later a U19, with a data managing coordinating center at WashU, and then four field sites, uh, Boston University, Columbia, University of Pittsburgh, and then University of Southern Denmark, where I'm located. And then we have a demography group at Duke. And what we're interested in is basically families like this. And you can see the generation one are the long-lived siblings. And they are typically born in the first third of the 20th century. Their children, generation two, are also included. And they are born in the middle of the 20th century. And now we also started including the grandchildren who are up to like 50, 60 years old uh, that are born uh, in the later part of the 20th century. And uh, currently we have about 5,000 individuals included. There are two generations included f from the beginning and at least one zip pair. There should be at least one zip pair in the upper generation. And then the question is, of course, how do we define exceptional longevity? And this is a score that compares uh, sip sip survival to the background population. But to give a feeling of it, the minimum requirement is two sips more than 90. That's more or less it. And to illustrate the exceptionality of it, less than 1% of the Framingham family would qualify for our study. Um, they are longitudinally measured. Uh, the visit two were after eight to 10 years, and currently we are doing visit three. And there's many publications showing the advantage in health from these two generations. And some of them are really big. These are three of our showcase Danish families uh, uh, long lived. And of course, this is a huge project with many real good researchers. And what I want to focus on today is the corner of the long life family study that deal with Danish register data. And this is kind of a spin-off project of the overall project. And it is uh, based on the fact that we have a very good civil registration system, a national healthcare system, and church book. That meant that when we were looking for family like this, we could do it systematically. So we found many more families than that was needed for the long life family study. Actually, we found 10 times as many. But once we know them, we can follow them in the register. So we made a separate Danish register study based on this initial work. And that meant that we could have 5,000 offspring of our own, so to speak, and 10,000 grandchildren of these long-lived that we can follow individually. 
And then the trick is these Danish national registers that all of us here in Denmark have a unique identifying number since 1968. And That is linkable within Denmark uh, Statistic Denmark, and we can also add in our survey data. So we have the hospitalization, the prescription medicine, the education data, all of it. And of course, there's very strict rules on confidentiality, uh, but we have a long and good tradition on working on these data. And they give us so many opportunities to try to understand what is it about these families, because one thing is that we have the information on the families, but from Statistic Denmark we can draw age and sex match controls, and because it's the whole population, we can usually take 10 or 20, so there's plenty of control, which give really good statistical power. In addition to this, we also good historical uh, information, so in order to try to understand what is it about these six sisters and similar families. Then we wanted to go back to their childhood, of course. And this is actually a picture of the six sisters' family in, in, the, in 1920. You can see all the boys are gone uh, following up on the sex differences in mortality uh, mentioned before. But Was, and this might be embarrassing, but when we were looking into this, then it suddenly, at least to me, I realized that, well, to have a big, long-lived ship, you need a stable family in your childhood. It takes quite some time to make a big ship. And especially when we look for controlled families, here we use the spouse's family. Then, of course, there we came across single mothers, Uh, families with only one child, and so on. So therefore we had to be very careful in who to compare with. So what we did was we went back to the 1916 census, found these families and other families with at least two children, which is what was needed to eventually qualify. And here we could see they were not very privileged because that was the idea that came up Are these kind of long-lived sibling studies just studies of people being socially, economically advantaged? That it's just social class we are studying. But it was not. They were not more privileged. They had similar occupation and so on, both to the controls and the whole population. So it was not something from their childhood. What about late in life with the long-lived siblings? Of course, there were It, it made no sense to look at the survival. They were selected because they were long-lived. But what if we compared them to other similar age, sporadic long-livers? We did that in the register and saw, let's say we had a 95-year-old sibling and then compared them to other 95-year-old siblings. Then we could see they have fewer diseases. And when we looked on survival from 95 onwards, They had lower mortality. So they're doing better even up there. And then we moved on to look at the children. How were their survival? And remember, they were not selected on surviving. They could die as infants or at age 40 or whatever they would be in the study. And where we had the good observation time was in the ages 20 to 70. That was where the observation time was. And here we could see that the children of long-lived siblings only have half the mortality of the background population. And then we were somehow stumbled upon the spouse's mortality. And somewhat to our surprise, we thought that they also have markedly reduced mortality, the spouses of the children of long-lived siblings. And that might either be assortative mating, or kind of a spillover effect from the healthy family. And then we kind of get, kind of, wow, is this going on? Let's look in the grandchildren. It was kind of far-fetched because the only thing they had on hand is that they have a grandparent that lived long who also have a sibling lived long. That seems not like a big start in life in terms of infant mortality, but indeed, 
they had a significantly better survival even in the infant period. Also when we control for all kind of twin birth or ethnicity in more recent generation and so on. So all three generations have better survival. Then the next question is of course, what is it about their health? And the first, as with a background of um, as a medical doctor, you are thinking, what diseases are they missing? What, are, what is the absence since they, they don't die as uh, early as uh, the background population? Then we looked first at disease incidence in the offspring. And I'll just use a little bit of time on this slide because there'll come more of them. And it's basically we are taking 17 groups of diseases based on hospitalization. Basically taking all diseases you can get hospitalized for, putting them into 17 groups. And then we list them uh, after where the longevity and rich family had the lowest occurrence to the, to the left. The dotted line in the top is one, illustrating if the longevity enriched family offspring were like everybody else. So far to the left you have mental and behavioral disorder. It shows that these offspring are only hospitalized half as often as the background population for mental and behavioral disorders. Then you move on and the two with the narrow confidence interval is cancer and cardiovascular disease and you can see that they only have three quarters of what they were supposed to have. And you can see it's basically for all disease group, the last one where it's not, it's benign tumors. There was no difference between uh, <coughs> the families and the control. And we have huge power, you can see, we have follow-up time in the hundreds of thousands in the case group and in the millions in the control group. So it's, it's very reliable data. Then of course, with cancer, it was interesting to see, okay, what cancers are missing? And here it was totally obvious that it was lung cancer. They only had a third of the lung cancers that they were supposed to. And remember still, this is the offspring of the long-lived. Nobody said they should live long or not have diseases or anything. And tobacco related generally. Also, when we looked at uh, cause of death, at the far right you can see the confirmation of this that I said they only have half the mortality, the, the little green and orange is, is showing the uh, overall mortality and then it's the different causes and again it's across the board. And some of you might have wondered about there's both a red and a black line and they are nearly on top of each other in each graph and that is the red one is controlling for socioeconomic class. So that is just to education as well. So this is not just an effect of better socioeconomic condition. Then we did the same thing with the grandchildren. And here you can see it's the same pattern across the board, lower occurrence of all diseases, but not uh, as marked as in uh, the offspring. Here it's only a quarter for mental and behavioral disease only. And it's also only three quarters of the mortality in the grandchildren generation. So, so that was clear, they get fewer diseases, but it's not specific diseases. And it's not, then we try to look within families, are there kind of cancer avoiding families, and heart disease avoiding families? No, it was all mixed. They were generally good in all this. Then we asked the question, what about uh, uh, robustness? And uh, this was robustness, what about resilience? Once they get sick, are they doing better? And again, we did the same trick. Then we take the longevity and rich family members, say they get a cancer. Then we find other similar age, similar gender, that the same year got the same diagnosis, and then we compare the survival. And again, the same result. The survival after cancer diagnosis 
is significantly better in the longevity-enriched families. So they're doing really good. But the lung cancer thing made us uh, think they look like pretty well-behaved people, these. Uh, kind of like they do what their mom told them, basically, pattern. So uh, then we looked into, and it was true also, there's a low occurrence of teenage pregnancy in, and parenthood in, in, in these families compared to the background population. And they actually also have a reduced divorce risk. And they get married in the late 20s. Now you might again think it's just education. But I previously told you there was no really difference in education and this cannot be explained by education. So it actually looks very much that they are good in navigating life. So basically, they have better survival. As, and now again, we're talking offspring and grandchildren. They have lower occurrence of virtually all diseases. They have better prognosis. And again, the only advantage they have, they have a parent or gain, grandparent that lived long and also had a sibling living long. And then, of course, as an epidemiologist, if you want to say, what is it about these families from all the data you have on them for like a century? Yeah, it's large and stable families. It's not particularly socioeconomic uh, associated. It seems to, if you're looking for a spouse, you might ask about their parents' and grandparents' lifespan because it seems to be helpful for your own survival here. Uh, there's a sort of mating or spillover. There's the lower uh, disease occurrence and they're resilient. And it tracks three generations. Right now, math from our group is gearing up to study the great-grandchildren where we'll have about 20,000 to see if we can pick up something down there. So there's no doubt that familial factors are important. And that is where it comes in so nicely that we are uh, part of the long life family study where we have all the omics data and uh, all the genetics and uh, where there's possibilities to look into whether uh, there's multiple rare protective variants, looking into the epigenetic mechanism and so on. But what I would like to argue for in the whole discussion about longevity and longevity enhancing things, don't forget the behavior. From an epidemiological point, it's kind of blow out there with a third of the lung cancers. It's kind of not hiding. It's so clear. Of course, behavior is both environmentally but also genetically influenced. We know that from a lot of behavioral genetics uh, uh, studies. And what we are doing now to follow up on this is that we are looking at accidents and emergency room visit in these families. It might be, for a big proportion, just low risk taking. And again, this is about navigating life with the cards you have on hand. It's kind of boring, but uh, it might work. Then we also want to look into end of life and cause of death in this to see if they leave the world differently than the rest of us. What about dementia? Do they avoid that to a bigger degree? And then we're really interested in looking into the mechanism of the infant mortality. It might be maternal behavior. Uh, we have chances to, to look at that as well because maternal smoking is in the register. And then finally, then we have the, the whole COVID thing where, of course, to look at whether the, the immune system is indicated to be much more uh, sufficient and robust and effective. But also, again, about the behavior, their testing, their vaccination, and so on, to get more insight into at least some of the mechanism in how these succeeded. And these are uh, the funding agency, and it's the whole group back in uh, Odense and at the University of Southern Denmark that has to be thanked. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. We have a question from uh, Vera Gornova. Run, Brenna. Run.
Fascinating talk, thank you. Um, I have a question about good behavior, and I'm, I'm sorry, <clears throat> maybe you said it, uh, but I missed. So for smoking, uh, I mean, did they, do you have data if they actually smoked, uh, or they were not smoking, uh, or whether they just were so resilient to the effect of the smoke? A, a very good point, and this is the advantage about having the register study and the survey data. Because in the register study, we can see that they have low lung cancer incidence. But you're right, it could be that they're just resilient. They smoke, but don't get the lung cancer. But then if you supplement with those who participate in the study and compare to the background population, you get the smoking habits and you can see they smoke less than the background population. But of course, your statistical sample is uh, 10 times smaller. We have a question from Joris up here. Run, Brenner. Sorry, I'll stop. Thank you, Cara. Is it actually possible to also go back in time and actually look at the generations before this very old people to see how well it was actually uh, genetically enriched in the generations before? Yeah, the zero generation, yeah. They actually also have better survival than the background population, the, the parents. And how many generations can you go back in the Danish register? There, there's work ongoing to try to go as far back as the church book uh, saved, but it's ongoing work, so we're not there yet, but we can work our way. But the problem working backwards is that the, the numbers don't get much you know, <laughs> bigger. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. We will move on now, but that was a fantastic talk.